Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now introduce our fourth speaker for the day, Dr. Balaraman Ravindran. He is one of the most eminent professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering of Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and who has 17 years, 17 plus years of experience in IIT Madras as well. And he is currently a head of Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence and Mind Tree Faculty Fellow at IIT Madras. I now welcome Dr. Ravi to present his view on inter artificial intelligence for social impact. Ladies and gentlemen, with a big round of applause, let's welcome Dr. Ravi on the stage, please. Uh, is that better? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so, as uh, Dr. Mitchell said in the beginning, I am a professor. First and foremost, right? So that will be a little bit of lecturing in the slides. So don't worry, there are no exams after that. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no. But but I have to I have to also give you this caveat, right? There will be no exams at the end of the talk. So relax and uh, so let's uh, let's see how it goes, right? So even if you don't listen to my rest of my talk, I have given you the takeaway on the title slide itself. Right. So when you want to do AI for social impact, it is more important that you understand the domain. It's more important you understand the stakeholders. You more important you understand the beneficiaries of what you are doing, rather than worrying about very complex or deep AI technology. Right. So what I'm going to show you are some examples where we have not used state-of-the-art AI. Right. We have used actually AI techniques that existed you know, decades back. But still, we solve some very, very interesting problems that were not solved right, till today. So the point here is you should connect with your ecosystem. And you should not be working. I mean, this is a message that I should give for more academicians. You should not be working in your own isolation in your silo. right? But really look at what is the problem that you're solving and what is needed for solving the problem, not necessarily you know, trying to market things by you know, adding very complex AI tags to it. So that's a take home message, right? And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that we are doing. So my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Nandan, will be talking in the afternoon and he will, we kind of, we've split the duties, right? I'm going to talk about the social impact side. He will talk more about the work that we are doing with the government, right? So the e-governance side of things. So first thing, AI is everywhere. So uh, I can't use the pointer on the screen, So, but I hope you can all see. Uh, so the bottom left, whenever you go out online and do some purchasing, a lot of AI is happening in the background, right? So it's, I mean, people in metro cities, we are using AI like every day, right? whether we realize it or not, right? So whether you use the Google map to come here, Right? Or, or you buy something on Amazon or Flipkart or you talk to your machines at home or whenever. I, I think about half the audience is currently using an AI. Right? Like I'm fiddling around with your smartphone. So you are using AI when you are doing that. There is emails or search engines or even more uh, things like you know, uh, radiology. Right? It's something that people say, say is very ripe for uh, you know, in, intrusion of AI. Right? And there are many, many instances like in uh, understanding mammogram images or looking at chest x-rays where AIs are suppo supposedly doing better than humans, right? And not just in these kinds of uh, areas, but also in uh, things like, you know, it's more soft decisions. This is, this is where AI is running into trouble, where they are run, running head along into humans, right? So you have courts that are using AI for making bail decisions, right? Now that is old news because that AI was making so many mistakes, right? And it was shown to be really, really biased in its decision-making that they had to actually take out the AI from this uh, whole uh, workflow, right? So now they don't use the AI anymore for uh, making decisions. It's gone back to the old fashioned way where humans are making decisions, right? And same thing with, uh, you know, lending and loan, loan decisions and, and things like that, right? Again, it, it becomes more and more critical, right? That uh, we have to worry about lot of other soft issues, right? It's just not about technology anymore, right? And so we have to worry about ethical uh, use of AI and responsible use of AI and so on and so forth. And uh, so this is, it's, AI has matured to a point where we start thinking about other issues, right? So where people from policymakers, lawmakers, all of them have to be aware of what AI is doing now. That's the point we have reached uh, with AI. 
right? Uh, in fact, I should also point out. So I was actually, uh, you know, consulting with uh, the Niti Aayog on putting together a document on responsible AI policy for the country, right? And uh, in the appendices of that document, there is only one other AI responsible AI policy that is cited. Any guesses? The Tamil Nadu government. So we, we were the first to get there. So, uh, but still a lot of work needs to be done, right? So, so uh, my only grouse with that document was it was done mostly by the government. It was not done in consultation with other stakeholders. So we, we need to maybe revisit it and revise it and things like that. But then we, we are in that track to making sure that AI actually can be used for solving real problems. Right? So now, now comes the, you know, the professor hat, right? So AI is not new. Uh, so this is Alan Turing, who originally asked this question, right? I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And then he came up with a very famous answer. And uh, the answer is so famous that we, they used it as the title of his uh, uh, biographical movie, right? The Imitation Game. So he basically said, can AI Im imitate a human, right? So that's a way to say that a machine think is if I can't tell a machine apart from a human, just by the responses, right? So that basically is the question was asked back in 1950. So AI is not new, right? And, um, you know, so it started off with this, right? Replicating human behavior was considered a hallmark of intelligence, right? So that's where it started. And it's not certainly, it's, that's not where it stayed, right? AI has moved far away from that. Right? So we are not interested in replicating human intelligence or human thought processes as a primary goal of AI anymore. AI is now becoming more and more of a problem solving tool. Uh, but that's where we started, right? But then AI hype is also not new. So some of you might, I mean, if you've heard me talk before, you might have seen this, right? You can read the quote on the screen. The Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Amazing, right? <clears throat> so when was this statement made? Any guesses? It's an article from 1958. Okay, so AI hype is not new. So this has been hype forever, right? So from the 50s, we have had this AI hype, right? Uh, AI success is also not new. So that's Arthur Samuels playing checkers with the computer. This is a live demonstration on TV, right? Uh, and this happened back in uh, back in 56, right? So you can imagine why people were hyped up in 58, right? So they think, oh wow, we can play checkers. The computer can play checkers with a human being. Then it, it just solve the rest of the world's problems soon enough. Then I don't know. For me, my first interest in AI came when you know AI uh, engine started playing very well in chess, and then uh, then we had this uh, Deep Blue uh, that beat the Gary Kasparov. Right. So at that time, I used to think, you know, I don't know how many of you are from my vintage remember this. So Vishwanath Anand used to keep losing to Gary Kasparov. He'll beat everyone else in the world, and he'll keep losing to Gary Kasparov. And it so happened that Anand beat the computer, and then the computer beat Kasparov. And I was thinking, okay, this is the only way Anand is going to get the better of Casper. <laughs> so, but it was, I mean, so this kind of captures your imagination about you know, what can AI do and, and, and things like that. So it started there. And then, of course, uh, Watson was mentioned uh, in uh, Dr. Mittal's talk as well. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it was an amazing piece of engineering, right? So it, they actually won a general quiz competition. So AI is like amazing, right? So, right? And then, of course, uh, you can do object recognition, you can look at a picture and tell what is there better than humans, right? The AI has actually achieved superhuman performance there, superhuman performance in speech recognition, right? So all your Alexa, uh, Google, wow, thank you. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the Google Home and other things, right? They're doing very good at voice recognition, right? They're doing better than humans, right? Of course, there was this news item sometime back uh, where an AI beat the world champion in Go, right? Uh, or you could think of, <sighs> You know, video games, very complex strategy games, right? And uh, so, uh, DeepMind StarCraft II is better than 99.8% of all human players, right? So, great. And, and even not just games, look at that. So, so you can see the top right, right? So, that, so, the computer was given that outline and it produced that kind of a impressionist painting, right? It's just done by an AI. Now it's come to a point where they're actually holding annual AI art competitions. So artificial intelligence generate art and they're now selling for big money. So it's actually becoming a huge uh, you know, business and things like that. So it's doing amazing stuff. 
and then of course uh, more uh, usefully right so ai also solved a very complex problem called protein folding right and now to come to a point where now we are able to publish you know databases of protein structures which are more reliable than it has ever been in uh, the history of people studying protein folding and opening up new venues for research looking at all of this right so i'm not i'm not, i'm not here interested in solving you know all this artistic problem right we don't want to solve game playing right um we don't have to compete with google and microsoft right so what we are really doing we want to look at is solving simple i mean not simple it's all everyday problems but we can do this using simple machine learning right uh, so uh you don't really need deep ai expertise that's the point i'm driving so what we are really should for fetal age estimation so that's basically to figure out whether a fetal the baby will be born prematurely or not right and it's actually a very important problem so we have about 3.6 uh, uh, million babies that are born annually in, in a premature fashion in india it's a huge problem right nearly 25 one fourth of the global preterm births deaths happen in india that's because we don't have a good model that can predict early enough right if the baby is going to be premature or not because all the models that are there right all the equations that people use for making these predictions were built with european or american like basically mostly caucasian and maybe you have a few uh, you know african american thrown in there but certainly not looking at indian population right so we actually worked on this right and uh, and, and uh, so we worked with a larger team and then we got data from uh, haryana right and uh, we built this model right which was able to do uh, so this are the, just giving you all kinds of things right so this is something that we had to do with people who are in the field right so they told us what are all the important you know data that we should gather right it's not that i just sit there put on my hat and then take a table and say okay i'm going to run an algorithm on this table and i'll get results right you work with the people in the ground in fact i'll show you on the last slide how many collaborators were involved right so we work with people in the ground understand what are the important uh, data what is easy for them to measure what is not easy for them to measure all of these right we had to do a lot of hard work on the ground before we get the data right and then it turns out that uh, I'll, i'll skip some of these uh, it turns out that uh, we could come up with a very oops i can't i can see the green highlighted line right that is the final model that we came up with you don't need a deep neural network for that right so we just did regression very simple regression if, if people here who are technically inclined right and it turns out that it beats all the best models that are there in the world right so that's that's the message that i want to convey right so this is a real problem we are solving it we are getting better results than whatever is the best out there in the world whatever people are using in the field right now and we are able to do this with simple things like linear regression we really didn't have to because we understood the problem we understood how to select the you know cohort on which we are doing this ai building right so and then we came up with this i have a few more uh, slides that tell you but the thing is so the red arrow is indicating how much error our system is making right so it's actually at the bottom so we are ours is the best model uh, in terms of making predictions i'm so i apologize for all these charts and uh, technical thing but i always say prof so i'm i'll take uh, hide behind that right so again this was a joint effort with the uh, thsti right? and uh, of course our uh, own initiative for biological systems engineering and it was funded by a variety of government departments and also bill, bill gates uh, the the melinda and uh, bill gates foundation right so it's it's a fairly large project you can see that number of people that were involved people that who are actually biologists people doctors right and also healthcare uh, other healthcare professionals all these people are involved in building this simple equation but at the end of the day it's a quadratic equation all of us would have looked at this quadratic equation in school right but to get there and to say that that quadratic equation is what is useful we need so much work right and uh, here is another project that we did along with uh, google uh, and uh, this uh, ngo called arman uh, where uh, the goal here is uh, to make sure that uh, pregnant women get the information that is required so that they can take care of their own health 
right? So M Mitra is a program that was launched with uh, support from the uh, central government on you know making phone calls at appropriate times and telling the women, okay, you should go get this test now. You should have you know seen all these things happen. Basically, give them all the information that is required, right? Quite often, if you know how things work in our villages, right? So, you know, women are mostly are driven by superstition. Right? So, uh, and so to make, to like, kind of get this information to them, the, the, uh, the target area is not urban, right? So this is mostly semi-urban and rural uh, women were the target for this. And, uh, but the main challenge was that a lot of them actually quit the program. Right? So you start calling, maybe like they take some 10 calls, 15 calls, 20 calls, and after that, they stop answering the phone. You now the question is, can you do this, some kind of an intervention right? uh, that, you know, that kind of brings them back on board? But then for after they stop taking the calls, there's no way I can reach out to them. Right? It becomes harder. So if I can proactively predict, oh, okay, this, this looks like this, this lady is going to stop attending calls. You should do something about it now. Right? So can we do that? So that's basically what we started looking at. Right? And uh, so I'll... Right? And then when you start extending this to two months, you can see that the difference between the methods vanish, right? We could have as well used the simple, uh, you know, uh, decision tree based approach as opposed to using all the complex uh, deep, le deep learning based technology. Uh, and uh, then we went ahead and created this kind of a dashboard for the uh, Armand people so that they can follow up on uh, looking at women. So now the study is going on as to how effective is this in, in kind of reducing the drop off from the program. Now, actually, it's gone to the field, right? So now the, there's a field testing that's going on. That's Google, right? It's part of Google's AI for social good initiative. Again, a whole bunch of people involved, all the people at the top. this problem and you know, built these simple models uh, that we could then deploy onto the, onto the real world, right? So this team is a little old. Now the team has gone actually bigger. I can't, the current team, I can't even put it on one slide. So that's how many people are now involved in getting this to work. Right? And uh, here's another, I, I apologize for the crowded slide, uh, but the point I want to talk about here is there was this iron hacks challenge that was run uh, in collaboration with the government of uh, Indiana. Right? So they wanted a model to predict the footfall, right? how much traffic would come in public spaces during the peak of the first wave of COVID. Right? They wanted to build a model that allowed people uh, you know, to plan. You know? So the, to the, the city governments, right? the, the, the town governments, they can plan when, uh, when they should you know, close down certain uh, public spaces, when they should open it. And they released a lot of data that they had measured over uh, a few uh, years. And then they asked people to build a model. This was an international challenge. And it was won by a student from IIT Patras. And what he did was, again, very, very simple model. So that's the guy who won this. And uh, so he compared against all this uh, fancy uh, deep AI models that were all deployed, right? And then people, uh, and then when he compared against this, this was way, way better. His very simple model was way better than all the uh, deep learning models that had entered the competition, right? So in fact, he was featured in some newspaper articles that came out. <laughs> so uh, we don't know about what, what happened here, right? So we, it's, it's, it's so these kinds of uh, you know challenges and uh, you know reach out outreach from uh, places will certainly help us work better. And here's an interesting project that I was partially part of. So I have to say that uh, right now it's a, a product from Dwara E Diary. So it all uh, thing. So you know how they identify cattle. So they put this. So it turns out the muzzle, the patterns on the muzzle is as unique as the fingerprint. 
right so and then so we worked with the people in uh, dwara e dairy and so we did the initial uh, proof of concept implementation for them but this needed a deep learning solution this is something which we couldn't solve using standard we, we did try you know, we, we can solve using some standard uh, uh, you know algorithms we needed something that came recently right so and uh, now now we have very good uh, you know results so much so that they are happy to commercially launch this product right so uh, again very down to earth solution right this is not something you know you would expect the western countries to solve for us right so this is something that we have to look at and we have to solve so here is a kid i, I don't want to leave you with the message that all deep learning is hype <laughs> so deep learning does solve useful problems for us right so that's the uh, the final uh, use case i wanted to give summing up like this is like final thoughts we are closer than ever to really functional ai right but the caveat is we thought we were there several decades ago so we think again we are there so we have to be very careful we shouldn't let the hype you know overwhelm us we have to be very careful in how we actually end up adopting uh, ai solutions now, right but then we are really close to functional ai there are a lot of interesting problems we are solving right importantly ai is affecting many aspects of everyday life i sometimes jokingly say that you know this is true because lawyers and lawmakers are now talking about ai <laughs> so that's it's being it's starting to impact every every everyday life uh, but also it can have significant social impact not just uh, everyday life so you have to think about that right uh, but and here is a i want to leave people with this caveat so the biggest danger from ai is humans rushing to market before the technology is ready right ai by itself is not dangerous right regardless of what you hear in in, in the popular press ai by itself is not dangerous its danger comes from the humans who are trying to deploy technology that's not ready so so discussions are really needed on you know regulation of ai right talking about things like liability and so on and so forth right and i'm happy that we as a tamil nadu government and the state here have started taking the lead on this and i i would really would like to see us become the overall ai leaders of the country thank you Okay, I'm happy to do Q and A if people have any. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, go on. As AI is coming in, uh, you know, people are forgetting that they could solve problems using simpler solutions. And for every problem, we would rush to AI without finding a quadratic fit or an exponential it's fit. The solution is a, to call the quadratic fit also AI. Yeah, that's there, but. Uh, so there i had a question could you have so i was not uh, you know fully understood the what happened behind it but could you have done that in 1950s was there any role of you know uh, ma processing massive data which they could not have done in 1950s to arrive at a quadratic situation so yes so the data gathering pipeline has evolved significantly so for us in it especially in india to have gathered that much data like from 7000 women and making sure that the data is of high quality getting good quality scans where i can actually do the you know the 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 rump to crown length right so that's basically the only measurement that is valid right so you take the rump to crown length of the fetus and use that for making the uh, prediction to to get that accurate estimation right wouldn't have been possible in the 60s right so now we have a lot better equipment lot better scanning equipment and and more prevalence of these scan equipments everywhere so we are able to get good data right so that is why revisiting this whole solutions makes sense because the data quality has improved so much so what couldn't have been done earlier can now be done right with the same kind of tool we shouldn't just jump into the because as soon as you say you are having some measurements from scans right people will say oh just use a deep learning so the cnns will solve this for you it just give it give a scan to the cnn but doesn't make sense quite often we don't even though we have a lot of data 7000 women is a lot but that's not enough to train a deep learning system very good morning professor uh, i'm swami nathan i'm the ceo of smarty uh, mm -hmm. we work on edtech we uh, we're doing we're developing a solution which is going to grade the answer papers the descriptive answer papers of students
perception of the uh, uh, the the i mean what the teachers will actually mm. give mm. so now the question i have to you uh, to you probably is that two aspects one is that how democratization of these so called ai technologies has helped us to take the first step so from the tensor flows to the pi to pi torches to the mm. all these uh, algorithms which are now ready made packages which is available where we didn't have to go through the whole nine years of writing thousand lines of code and then it's like just one line as you as you showed that's that's one on can you just throw some light on that the second one is what is the government what what should the government do in terms of giving this data to entrepreneurs like us because without the data as you told the data is the the biggest uh, uh, what do i say uh, either it is the biggest boon or is the biggest curse you have to have the right data and you have to have the unbiased data as well so how do we sure. handle these situations and what is your advice to us and what is your advice to the government to provide data like this thank you okay thanks so there are two parts to the question so let me take the first part right so uh, how much has democratization of tools helped us so uh, so it's amazing right so the, um, the the amount of code that you have to write i mean you talked about tensorflow but then there are even lower end things like uh, so aws for example or azure has their own uh, you know drag and drop kind of uh, you know visual programming tools now for uh, building solutions and uh, what this has allowed uh, people to do is actually to you know put together solutions very quickly right without truly understanding uh, the implications of it so for me it's great because it gives you a very low entry bar to getting into you know actually building ai products right so that is a very good part of it but what i'm a little bit more concerned is that many ai quote unquote training programs or reskilling programs end up being programs that allow you to use these tools right not necessarily tell you how to interpret the outputs of the tools so we are not yet to a point where somebody who is a domain expert right like I'm certainly not some some agricultural technologists can't sit with these tools and build their own application they want they would be able to make sense out of the output right but not the data scientists who has learned how to drag and drop these boxes and like, like learning visual programming right so they will still need this you know the ecosystem for them to actually make good use of this so that you know awareness should should be there more in in the community is what i feel so that's that's the first part it's, it's a great thing to happen let's reduce the entry bar but every as with all good things it comes with its uh, you know caveat the second part um what should the government do um well see the government has certain kinds of data right and some of it is publicly releasable right and they have done it so in fact uh more so than other governments right so there are a few western governments which have very good open data policies but the indian government is getting there and uh, and i think uh, the challenge is to get this data in a usable format right and uh, there are certain uh, you know initiatives going on for that as well but at least if you go to uh, you know uh, data.gov.in the whole you'll get a lot of dumps of pdfs of various kinds of data and all the population data is already published so so jibu is smiling maybe he can <laughs> talk about, mention something about it during your uh, panel also you can bring it up uh, but then a lot of government data that's available that is can be released in the public domain all right but there are a lot of other data that you can usefully bring up all right so all these things i talked about it we didn't need government data right so we are actually there is uh, there are ngos that are who have feet on the ground who are generating very very good data there are hospitals right uh, not just private hospitals even government hospitals are willing to reach out to you and then see what they can do in terms of partnering with uh, technologists in in solving problems right talk to the smart city corporation so they are happy to help with uh, uh, you know with all the data that they are gathering right? or or uh, the center of excellence in uh, tngga right so uh, so so many you know the, the you know that the tngga center of excellence is not fully a government body right so they have a little, little bit more autonomy than that right so there are ways in which they can uh, interface with the people so data is there a lot of data is there it's just that it's not given to you in a drive in a, in a, in a, in a rdbms format right so you have to do some work to get the data in a usable format and i i think instead of sitting back and saying that we need the government to give us the data appropriately i think we should also put in a little bit of the hard work in fact and the center that uh, the the robert watt center that i had so we annually fund multiple projects for doing data set gathering 
right? And then we are we are curating the data and releasing it. So we have already released some data for the Indian road traffic, right? Looking at vehicle vehicle monitoring, so that things that can be used for counting vehicles and getting traffic density estimates and recognizing vehicle types and things like that. So like that, we have already released the data. Like that, we are going to be releasing several such data sets as, as time goes. So let's answer the second part. You had a question? Okay. Thank you. Hello, doctor. Huh? Yeah, yeah, sir. Good afternoon. It was an amazing lecture. And, um, yeah, uh, See, I told you it will be a lecture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have two questions, doctor. Like, uh, the first question is like in terms of AI research, right? Like, so I'm Shira, my founder of a startup called Power One Tusker Innovation. Uh -huh. So we're building an end to end uh, no code uh, visual AI platform uh, for AI engineers to develop a uh, visual AI solution without writing any code. So um, given that context, like, like so uh, we do a lot of research and try to get a lot of research work uh, from the internet, right? GitHub and all of that. We find less of uh, research paper based technologies developed and published in GitHub. Uh, that you shared like we shouldn't adopt it until it is ready to uh, uh, or mature enough to go ahead and do it how do we go about and ensure that maturity happens thanks dr okay. um man this is becoming a uh, team right two questions from everyone so the first question uh, uh well uh, we have to ask ourselves how much of research is happening in india that is shareable on GitHub, right? So maybe the fact that there is not that much code that is being shared on GitHub is a reflection of the fact that there is not that much shareable code being written in India, right? So I I, I know it's it's a it's a not a great state of affairs, but uh, we should get there, right? So in fact, I know a lot of very very interesting projects that happen in you know tire what. The so called tier two, tier three institutes, right? But I'm not sure if the students there have an awareness of uh, that they should, they can put this on GitHub and make it popular and things like that. So, in fact, a lot of the work that happens in our center, we have a GitHub repository for the center and it's published. And we, of course, tweet about it, put it on LinkedIn and things like that. But continuing with the same thing, right? Number of AI researchers from India who are on these platforms is very little. In fact, there is this whole academic Twitter community, right? Which there's very little presence from India, right? Maybe two handfuls of people, right? So again, all of these needs to change. We need to evolve this culture. Uh, I'm not sure if there's an easy answer to it. It just takes over time. I, I think I'm being told that I'm talking for too long. So uh, uh, to answer your, uh, uh, quickly answer your second question. Uh, I didn't say don't use AI technology right till it's mature enough i said you should know what you are getting yourself into right and figure out what the caveats are right and the only way to get the technology to mature is to have more and more conversations with the people who are the end users of this technology right and uh, centers like ours are facilitating it right and we need more such things right so it's not that uh, you know just the iits can do this not just the technologists can do this. We need to get people from policy. We need to people get people from the legal fraternity. All of these uh, communities have to come together, right? And then have these discussions. And that's happening in India, right? More so than most other countries out there, right? And I'm confident maybe in the next few years you will see more of a you know responsible AI policy uh, getting involved that's applicable to our country. Right? So I'm I'm pretty sure that's just around the corner. Sure. So I, I, I have sir. to stop here. Yeah. So due to the paucity of time, uh, we'll restrict the questions to two to three uh, per speaker. So yeah, you can take it. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. It was very informative for all of us here. Thank you once again. A big round of applause for Dr. Ravi again. I will now request uh, Dr. Neeraj Mittal. Principal Secretary, Department of Information Technology, Tamil Nadu, to please do the guest of honors to Dr. Ravi, please.
Thank you once again, Dr. Ravi, for joining with us today.